certainly living through an intense time, mm -hmm. uh, an increasing intensity. Um, you know, we thought the pandemic was enough, and now we're in a war. I, you know, it just um, it keeps on going, yeah. uh, and 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 yet the uh, there's a, a kind of male white aesthetic in some poetry that is all about restraint, hmm. just all about restraint. And writers who are intense in their work sometimes get criticized for it, and particularly women writers, hmm. Anne Sexton, Sylvia Plath. Um, so, uh, but I can't really be anything but intense, and, <laughs> and I suspect that the same is true of you. I don't think you usually start out saying, I'm going to write an intense poem. It's something that comes from inside. It's um, in the poems that I wrote for this book. Uh, she speaks to the birds at night while they sleep. That was in the early days of the pandemic. Um, and the intensity, I felt, was mostly internal, like, what's going on? I don't know how to express this. I, it was like a diary I was writing to myself every night. Um, basically writing it on my iPad right before I went to sleep to just kind of download so that I could sleep at peace with my thoughts. And, and I didn't even really consider that they were intense in any way, but I think there, there is a struggle and, and that a certain kind of intensity is a struggle between the peace and calm you want to have inside and maybe you know what you can't control. What you can control and what you can't control. And I think that shows up all the time in, in my poems. And um, what I felt from your poem, the poem that I really, um, I love two of your poems, and the one I most um, want to, want you, would love for you to read is the poem Too Long, um, because I feel like that, there is an extreme amount of intensity in that. <laughs> Too long I've been trapped in the false polarity of mother and armed robbery. Eggs sizzle on the skillet while I dance tango, and lies spill from my mouth like shiny coins. I don't care much for guns, but they look good in a woman's hand. I don't care much for babies. Eggs are about all I can tolerate, but even then I shatter their fragile skulls. People think I'm tough, but they don't see the wet wound. My own mother married her bitterness and stayed faithful. Our globe is crowded with lapsed fathers. We are sentenced for our crimes of need of innocence, the smell of gasoline is everywhere. Its dark music overwhelms the weeping. I take my eggs scrambled with the side of ammunition. Tango enacts the polarity of nomads. Are we not all babies in our grasping? That poem just blows me away. The, the contrast between babies and armed robbery and um, the, the weaving of eggs and violence, the, the fragility of eggs, what they represent, that birth, um, new beginnings, they also how nutritious they are, um, all the different things that they are that are mostly good, but how fragile they are. And then to bring in, um, you know, the mother, that line, um, my own mother married her bitterness and stayed faithful. That was incredible. Um, just that contrast between innocence and violence, it really creates a tension in the whole poem. Um, and then it's like, you don't really let us up let us off the hook by ending with, are we not all babies in our grasping? 
our grasping, our need, our wanting for something that's solid, that's not fragile like a, an egg or like a mother that clung to her bitterness. So I'd be really curious about um, how you came, upon, came, with, came up with this poem, where it, where it emanated from. This is a, the kind of poem that I could never think my way into. I didn't start by saying, oh, I'm going to write a poem about any of these things. Um, at the time, I was doing a lot of fevered writing, writing without uh, a plan, without knowing what I'm going to write about, just set the timer and go. And then I just was pulling lines from that that seemed mm -hmm. to, to fit together, or, or lines that had a, a kind of energy or re resonance. And then I would uh, let those lines, I would write new lines to respond to those lines. I like the idea that my writing is more intelligent than, than, I, than my, than oh, my wow. rational brain is, uh -huh. that there's a creative intelligence that's going to be at work if I just get out of the way and let that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I quite like formal structures, not sometimes traditional ones, but untraditional ones. I like to have some guardrails. Um, Free verse is a little bit too uh, open-ended for me sometimes, so I'll often have a syllable count or, mm -hmm. um, you know, something like Tercet. Uh, I totally resonate with that. <laughs> gives me some security. <laughs> yeah. I've been totally into that during, especially during the pandemic. It's like I want something that sets some boundaries and kind of gives me a, a a container that makes sense. That the words sometimes I you know, make the words fit the container versus, you know, which sure. you, uh, can, can add more creativity even. And do you know why eggs are so prevalent? Or they just, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you can logically come up with an explanation about that, but. I, I can say that my mother appears in my work all the time. So that's a theme, you know, we all have themes that we come back to. Mm -hmm. And um, the, Failures of the family system often show up in my work. And I've written quite a bit about the decision to remain childless mm. in my life. Um, eggs, I can't, I can't really say. <laughs> uh, oh, and, and gasoline. If you read over a lot of my poems, there, there's, oh. you'll find a lot. Of, my stepfather used to manage a gas station in, in Detroit <laughs> when I was growing up, and uh, so there's a lot of gasoline. I particularly liked, you know, I, I don't care much for guns, but they look good in a woman's hand. And I was like, oh, to myself, like, oh, that's, I shouldn't think that, but she's right. <laughs> I like that. You know, um, I, you know, I perceive myself as being a very peaceful person, but I like that. I know, I just feel like, you know, it's a symbolism more than a actuality, but it's a symbolism to me of, you know, we're not taking no prisoners here. You know, we women have, we're done. <laughs> we're done with being dominated. Um, also the contrast of babies and gasoline and that line about, I don't care much for babies. I think that's so brave. We started off talking about different ways of getting to intensity. And I think those contrasts for me uh, are, are one of the ways that I foster intensity in a poem. You know, that um, beauty and difficulty, beauty and cruelty, um, yeah, yeah. I, you know, are, are something that I have done in other parts of yeah. my work. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah, and I think that does show up. I'm just thinking about the, the sounds too, like the L sounds are more relaxing. And then there's the, you know, the hard sounds, the, the guns, the, the B sounds, the skulls, those contrast too in the poem. So you get a lot, uh, there's a lot of ways to, I don't know, you know, to create it either consciously or unconsciously. Like you consciously uh, didn't put any punctuation here. So that's also a way of, you know, it's, a, it's a bit rebellious, I guess you'd say. So I'm wondering now if you would read Getting Out and we can kind of see your... Uh, <laughs> My rebellious side. Your, yes, <laughs> your view of intensity or, okay. or how you foster it. Okay. 
Oh, those are your poems. Um, well, this poem, Getting Out, is a new poem that um, I just wrote actually a couple weeks ago. Um, it's a little bit of an, I don't know if it's an anthem or a, just been through a pretty intense part of my life. Um, moving on from a group, a community of spirit, a spiritual community that I was a part of for over 48 years. And um, a, something happened <laughs> that uh, changed me. So I'm, I've left that group and I've been processing it for the last two years amidst the, all the other stuff that's going on. <laughs> So that's where this, uh, this poem comes from and some of the, the poems from um, the She Speaks to the Birds book. So this poem is called Getting Out. I've cut my hair and cut my ties, sliced off fingers of what was precious, fled the bloody scene. I've pulled the curtain tight, rode hard from the faces behind it. That life, a murky pond. I've dug a grave and thrown myself in, an old rendition clothed in stippled silk, a paper crown, semblance of some god-drunk dynasty. I put on a suit of velvet, purple fringe and crows, walked away unshod, ungloved, sworn allegiance to my skin and the candle half burned. I've a whisper of time left, eyes and lungs, a planet that snows, tells its people stories in sea and poppies, the wolf and its moon. I'm willing to ache to my end years, fitted in crepe and sallow, if in the maelstrom of my mind, of jars not full, feasts half eaten, I'm granted a glimpse of the red-tailed hawk, taste water cold on my tongue, hold a pen, a scrap, Ink flames on the page. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, I, the intensity of that poem, it's, it's almost like a, a manifesto That's or a declaration of independence. Um, and your imagery is so sharp and clear in that poem. The, you know, digging the grave, burying the old self in the ground, cutting off parts of oneself in order to make that escape. Um, it's just uh, riveting. Mm -hmm. And, and as, a, as the reader, I root for her. Like, <laughs> yeah, get, get out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, it's particular to me, of course, but I wanted it to sound... I wanted it to sound for anybody that was in a bad marriage or a bad job or just in their own getting out of, I think it's mostly getting out of your own fear, getting out of your own um, being uh, subsumed or you know subject to other, someone else's ideal of how you should live your life. And I think that's underneath it all. And how this poem came out was one of those blessed moments, I call them, because it really came out almost fully formed. And I think it was at night again. That's when I do my best. I don't sit at the computer and write much during the day. It's usually at night when the world has settled down and I don't have to think about laundry or what I have to fix for breakfast or, you know. so. It came out almost fully formed, and I was very grateful for that. And because usually it's you know there's the whole revision process, and it, it, there were there were revisions, but it 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 wanted to be said. It has that kind of urgency mm. that this this must be said. Did you find there was a cost to writing it, or did it was it all reward for having written it? I felt it's all re all reward. I felt, wow, <laughs> I felt wow to myself. You know how I mean, like you can look at a poem and just go, I, I don't know who wrote that, but I like it and, and, and it speaks to me. Um, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and reading a lot of books about people that were in um, what they call high control groups and whether it's in a, a, a marriage or a, a 
or a, a, a political group or a spiritual group or a multi-level marketing group. There's a lot of, you know, a dominance of people and do it my way and wear this and act this way and say this so to prove your worth. And um, so sorting that out after so many years and then coming to writing this poem felt, like you said, a, a bit of a manifesto, although that has a bit of a bad <laughs> rep these days for some in some quarters. It's so interesting in that poem too, how uh, we come around at the, at the end or near the end to that red tail hawk and, and how it's a, there's a kind of reconnection that goes on. The, most of the poem is about a disconnection from a situation mm. that has not proven uh, worthy <laughs> of that connection. But um, then there's this this reconnection with the things of of the world, with the things of nature, and it really feels like there's a coming home uh, at the end of the poem. I talked a little bit about that process of of fevered writing mm -hmm. and. Um, as years went by, I began to develop a process where I would take that fevered writing and cut it all up into all the nouns, all the verbs, all the adjectives. Mm, wow. um, I call that process disarticulation. I love that. When I saw that, I was like, what does that mean? And my husband's a chiropractor, so I went over it. I read this as like a, this is like a medical term. <laughs> And then well, it, it is, yeah, because it's you would take the skeleton apart as you're doing medical training. But so we're taking language apart mm -hmm. I uh, love that. in this process. Mm -hmm. And I started to collaborate with other poets. So we would use the same prompts. We would each do fevered writing. Then we would exchange the fevered writing and disarticulate it, take it apart. Mm -hmm. So then you make the poem based on that language uh, that you're given mm -hmm. by this other poet. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, the poet that I worked with on this poem is Tanya Kohong. And uh, the words came from her, but the arrangement is my own. So this poem is called Starfish. I'm a foreigner in my own country a country that was never mine. My people shot their way in, parked their guns in the schoolyard, brought gifts of fever and order, blueprint of nation and shame. In our hunger, we swallowed nature, tasted its dried blood on the ground. We divided the circle, took the biggest piece did not ask or hear the answer, made ourselves forget the origins, invented a language of dollars and rights, our rights to steal the blind hours, ashes of memory. If we think we are geniuses, others know us as monsters. We can never pay what we owe. Just buy more guns and documents. We live on pink pills to stomach our breakfast of leftover bone and tears. Round up the children who fear tigers, not us. Tell them there is no home here. Accuse them of their bad teeth and hair. Remind them who has power, not them. I am foreign in a country that was never mine. I dream the green wind, a road, a door that will not open, a fallen starfish in morning sun. Hmm. Dream the green wind. Wow. <laughs> Wow. So what, when you finish this or in the process of it, how are you relating to those words? White people are having a reckoning, a, a long, over, overly deserved, uh, long time coming reckoning 
with the consequences of colonization and oh, I uh, yeah, I, I could list, we could go on. <laughs> I could list all the crimes, but of course uh, this uh, this was written at a time, and unfortunately, it's still happening when children. Uh, immigrant children who have come to the United States seeking refuge are being kept in cages. And um, it just seemed like uh, particularly poignant that our, uh, our crimes were coming home mm. to roost. Mm -hmm. um, so when I got her words, and of course she gave me many more words than these. You don't have to use all the words; you pick and choose. Mm -hmm, of course. Um, but I, it was so clear to me where I wanted to go with mm. them. And and um, Tanya it, it, herself experienced the immigrant experience, and um, you know, I just I haven't had her experience, but I am linked to her experience on the side of the people who have um, benefited from the systems of oppression mm. that exist. Um, but you know, I, you don't want to give a lecture in a poem. Right, and so right. the beauty of, of poetry is that you can take these images and, and make those points. This is a different kind of intensity. It kind of builds, it kind of, it's like, I don't know when I say baked in. It feels like it's just, it's coming from a deep sorrow for me, a deep sorrow, but there is hope. There, there's, there's a lot of emotion. There's sorrow, there's anger, there's, you know, despair and hope. And, you know, that's a lot to put in a poem that doesn't say in kind of like none of those words are in there. So it's very skillfully done. I think it's pretty magical. Um, that, that this kind of par process, I find it fascinating. And it's that kind of a collaboration with two uh, poets that just can bring such a new, a new thing into the world. These poems were written in, I think, April 2020, almost. There's 28 poems. I might have left out a couple of them, but they were every night I would write them. So it was basically a whole month. And it was in the early days of the pandemic. Um, so these poems all have the same form. They're three, uh, they're tercets. There's um, six stanzas and they're very short stanzas and they do not have titles, just the, uh, the first line is the title. So this is, um, she walks barefoot. She walks barefoot in the dark over stones placed on the path a hundred years ago. Searches for a sliver of light someone to take her in, seat her at their table, give her food. It's a dream, and still she weeps when she wakes, yearns to be the one on that precipitous night to open the door and let her in. So I, the, I really love the quality of the Ouroboros in that poem, you know, that she's seeking to be taken in, but she understands that only she can take herself in. Uh, that's just so beautiful to yeah. me. Thank you. I think this also relates to not just what was going on as far as the pandemic, but also this break with, with my spiritual community of you know feeling that I was on a path. Um, and now that path has led me to somewhere that it just disappeared. You know, it was a dream, and you know, even though, you know, you could you could interpret dream as being an actual dream, or a dream of life, and how many dreams do we have in life that just all of a sudden disappear or dissipate or become corrupted? Yeah, I think it has the power to heal. Poetry has the power to heal. Reading it has had for me, in small ways and big ways, and also in writing it, and I'm. Be curious about if you have that have had that uh, experience of healing through writing or well, reading. I'm still here, so <laughs> I think that's that's this uh, is a lot. That's evidence, you know, because I might not be certainly, um, and I think I I see it so clearly in teaching. You mm. know, I uh, 
teach not just poetry, but other kinds of creative writing, uh, both in community settings and in universities. And I have just seen so much um, transformation mm -hmm. that takes place through that ability to express. Um, I used to teach a workshop for people with HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. And one of my students came uh, with a diagnosis of six months to live, and he lived for eight years and mm -hmm. published a beautiful book that was um, Gil Quadros, and his book City of God is still being written about and mm -hmm. talked about and shared. And uh, to less dramatic uh, extents, really everybody in that workshop had that experience. It was mm -hmm. a place to um, deal with with everything that they were going through. Yeah. You know, it's like there's to to delve into another person's perspective, written in a way that isn't didactic. You know, isn't someone telling you, but someone presenting a perception, a an idea in a way that lets you go in. Sure, and the and the writing of poetry allows us creative control over a situation that we might not have had control over. But suddenly, we're the ones that are choosing the words and choosing the arrangement, yeah. and, and we're making it ours. We're putting our stamp on it. Uh, and that can yeah. be very healing. Yeah. And, and I, that reminds me of, of uh, the poem, Getting Out, of your poem, Getting Out. Um, yeah. Because it's, it's taking that experience oh, and, and like, nope, I'm taking it right back. <laughs> yeah.